Yeah, my name is uh, John Stokey. I'm a recovering alcoholic and addict, um, going on four years sober uh, from opiate addiction. I'm, I'm a recovering addict named Chris. My name is Colton Baker. I'm a recovering heroin addict. Hi, my name is Jesse. I'm a recovering heroin addict. Um, my name's Luke. I'm 33 years old. I'm a recovering heroin addict. My name is Justin, and I am a recovering heroin addict. My name is Courtney. Um, I am um, a person with a substance use disorder. Before I moved into Recovery House, I had basically exhausted all my resources, all my money went towards my addiction. Um, thankfully, my family cared enough about me to help me get into treatment, um, both financially and you know, support-wise, morally, emotionally. Um, this and you know, I've had some bad things in my past happen to me a lot like other addicts, you know, I've had someone very close to me pass and I, it's been five years since she's passed and, you know, I haven't been able to talk about it, nothing to anyone and my therapist got me to talk about it and, you know, I'm more freely to talk about it to other people now. So, and that was a big part of my depression was that, you know, I lost someone very close to me at a young age that, you know, I cared a lot about that therapy does wonders to us addicts, especially our depression. You know, depression is a big part of the reason why we use, I think. Um, in, in addiction, we, we lose so much hope. We lose so, so many, um, not only just material things, we lose ourselves. We, we, uh, start to not even understand who we are and, and some of the things that we do and we find ourselves in a place where we never imagined being. And um, you know, one day when you wake up and, and you're in that world that, that you come to learn how to navigate through, but you really don't understand, um, you have to be able to regain back a lot of those things that you lose yourself, you know, your financial situations, your decision making, uh, your interactions, relationships, um, and, and part of that is learning how to live. Uh, I literally got to the point that I, I had my own apartment, I maintained my own apartment. But it really wasn't. Um, I think a turning point for me came in understanding that I literally did not even know how to live again. Was that my brother came to visit me in my apartment because of his concern about what was going on, and we sat down and we talked, and you know, he was kind of pretty slick, and he just kind of went through the apartment sat down, he saw how unkept my apartment was, and, and uh, it was in disarray, it was literally in a condition that people shouldn't be living in, and, and it really hit me when he pointed that out to me, uh, and that's when I realized that, that I had to make some changes, I had to I had to regain back those things that I used to have. Um, the transition living, when I decided to take advantage of that, literally helped to change my life. Uh, I've been suffering from this disease for about 10 years. 
I was uh, been to treatment center after treatment center. I, you know, lost hope a long time ago. Um, my family lost hope. My loved ones lost hope. Um, it came down to a life or death situation for me. It was either I was going to get clean or I was going to go on to the better ends. Um, if it wasn't for the recovery house, if it wasn't for the 12-step programs that I attend and do daily, um, I would still be in a gutter or under a bridge somewhere um, trying to find five dollars so I can get my next fix. Because that's, that's what I thought I was worth. Because, you know, I had a relapse in the house. And if it wasn't for living in these houses and it getting caught and brought to attention relatively quickly, it could have escalated into, you know, potentially death, another bottom, additional jail charges, and being broken homeless. But because of the guys that live in the houses, the accountability that is here, it was caught quickly. I was able to get, you know, right back on track and then continue to, you know, make adjustments in my program and continue to move forward. So basically, my experience with uh, medically assisted treatment is I was um, five years hooked to heroin. Um, I went uh, in and out of multiple treatment centers and uh, kept on leaving on this medication uh, called uh, Suboxone, which is basically a, a synthetic opiate. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't think I really maintained anything longer than four days sober on Suboxone. Uh, it was uh, it was a medication that helped me with detox, um, but ultimately transformed into dependence. And you know, at that point, it was um, it was one of those things where I. I would utilize it, especially when I realized it had street value. Um, you know, I, I would use it for a little bit, and then, you know, I, I would cap out my tolerance on it. Would 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 quickly go to a point that I needed more, or it wasn't satisfying needs. In which then, you know, depending on what my circumstances were, I would either sell it at that point to get dope, um, or I would only take it when I didn't have money. Um, <clears throat> so I basically used it as a crutch in, in, in gaps. Finally, um, in a moment of clarity on my probably sixth intervention with my family in uh, the treatment center, um, I, I basically told them, what I'm doing is not working. You know, going back to your guys' house, my parents' house, staying on Suboxone, things like that, it wasn't working. My addiction will not allow me to completely shut itself down. Um, in which I am begging and pleading for your guys' help to step in and basically make a decision for me and make some recommendations of whatever you suggest, I will do. This is five minutes that I'm giving you <laughs> that while, while my dick, I'm literally shutting my brain down. My brain will not allow me to have this conversation. And all I do is keep doors open in this process. So if I ever chime in or if I ever make a suggestion, you know, cut me off because I'm, I'm lying or I'm manipulating and I'm subconsciously probably doing it. Um, the recommendation was, John, you need to move into a transitional house, you need to get on Pivotrol. Um, I was like, okay, let's start this next month. And they were like, hell no, we're doing this right now.
Been uh, running uh, transitional living houses called Recovery House for almost three and a half years. I uh, work at a treatment center uh, called Assist Recovery Centers of America. I'm a patient care coordinator and I'm peer support up there. Um, I also uh, am the president and executive director of Archway Institute, which is a uh, nonprofit organization that um, helps fund um, people in recovery try to help fill those gaps uh, that the system has as far as people that you know are needing or wanting treatment but yet are turned away due to financial barriers, um, family support issues, uh, or just don't have the necessary means or resources to, to find appropriate uh, treatment. So Archway Institute is a, um, so basically when I got sober, Basically, the realization that came over me um, was that I had been living a very selfish, egotistical, materialistic lifestyle. And, you know, when you finally get to that point of being so down and out that you are contemplating suicide, you know, <clears throat> making whatever change that needs to get made is what you gotta do. Um, and I put a lot of thought into, you know, what, what was I going to do to get this happy, joyous, free mentality and to live the life that I wanted to live. And basically, you know, I, I did this process of looking at myself from a third party, you know, and evaluating myself and saying, okay, I'm going to follow John and, you know, <clears throat> see if... If, if I could be recreated, would I be this person? And the answer was no. No, I would not be this person. He looks miserable. He looks like he's only worried about himself. He's only worried about materialistic things. And he's not happy. And and, and that that was a deep thought for me. Um, and, and I came to the realization, well, you know, if I don't want to be that person, then who do I want to be? under six months sober, uh, my grandmother, who was one of my really close friends and relatives, was uh, diagnosed with ALS, um, and she had been suffering with it for a, long, for a couple years, um, and, uh, you know, I went and visited her, uh, I stayed with her for about three months, and, you know, my grandmother... Who had, me and her related, she was an alcoholic. Um, dealt with a lot of uh, depression, things like that, and you know, self-made woman. She was a widow, widower when you know my dad was like 15 years old, and um, you know, very independent woman. Never remarried. You know, um, very self-sufficient uh, financially. Seemed very successful, and um, you know, she when, when the way LS works is you know affects the all the muscles and body, but you're they call it being buried alive because you're fully aware of everything that's going on because your brain is unaffected, but your whole entire body is being completely crumbled. And I will tell you that with her last three months of living, the happiest I've ever seen her. She was bedridden, had no worries about materialistic things, relationships, you know, when, when she was basically just so happy that her friends and family were there, you know, with her. And, um, you know, she, she held a lot of resentments, a lot of bitterness, and a lot of grudges against people. And I went to her funeral and I saw the line of people that showed up to her funeral. And, you know, I mean, cars all the way out to the end of the funeral home and I was sitting there and I go, damn, you know, this is, this is a lady who has touched a lot of people and has done a lot for the community and has done a lot 
um, with with others and you know being the narcissistic selfish person that I am I, I, I looked internally with it and I said okay John if you were to die today who would show up to your funeral not many and you know and that that really drove me to to make uh, some drastic changes uh, in my thought process and my behaviors and you know what legacy did I want to leave behind and in this process you know a guy I know from the program um, he used to work for me um, had started up a coffee company and asked me to get involved but in, the, in this time I, I, I realized I needed to make a career change and didn't know quite what I wanted to do um, but decided that I was going to sell this coffee with this this fellow and um, and but what I was going to do with that money was whatever I made off of the coffee I was going to donate it to different treatment centers uh, with the idea that you know I had the financial backing and support from my family and I was blessed in that aspect to be able to get the proper treatment and help needed when I needed it. And you know, come to find out that it's not readily available, and it's not available to everybody. And, and the biggest barrier is financial um, issues and support. You know, it, it was one of those things. You know, uh, when we started, you know, how is the family going to receive us? How is society going to receive us? How is this going to have a long-term effect on us? And we did uh, a radio interview on uh, the Glover Show, and um, my dad ended up blasting it out to everybody he knew. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was crazy because the overwhelming support and appreciation from uh, the people that, that honestly we didn't know how, what the reaction was gonna be. <clears throat> and surprisingly, on the back end of it, my parents started getting all these phone calls from all these people. They're friends that they've known for 20 something years and, and longer. And come to find out, you know, their kids were struggling with drug and alcohol issues. Um, or they were aware of people struggling with drug and alcohol, or they themselves were in recovery or dealing with drug and alcohol issues. And, and I think that kind of drove my father to you know, jump on board with this and, and really take um, the lead on, on, you know, growing this network. And um, it, it's been really exciting to see and being, being able to help people when they're in need of it and they feel like they're lost, they feel like no one's there, and where do I turn? And, you know, we're able to assist them in whatever it is, you know, whether they need a bed somewhere, whether they need housing, whether they need money for food, whether they need whatever it is, you know, <clears throat> as little, you know, a lot of people think, you know, when they think of recovery and treatment, they're thinking of $100,000 treatment centers out in California or, you know, Malibu passages. And, you know, the reality of the situation really is, is, you know, people, for $100 to $500 is the difference between them satisfying the deductible, um, being able to pay for their medications, being able to pay for their first month's rent um, to get into a, a house that could potentially get them all the resources that are needed, um, to be able to you know, continue outpatient care or therapy. And um, you know, there, 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 there's a major gap that needs to get filled in the system now for close to four years and uh, you know it's uh, it's a mess I mean it really is Smile through your
your fears and sorrow smile and maybe tomorrow you'll see the sun come shining through for you light up your face with gladness hide every trace of sadness although I may be ever so near that's the time you must keep on trying smile what's the use of crying you'll find your life is still worthwhile if you just smile up your face with gladness hide every trace of sadness although a tear may be ever so near that's the time you must keep on trying smile what's the use of crying you'll find a life is still Recovery. I mean, the recovery house has enabled me to become the best version of myself that I could possibly be. Through, through staying sober, through following a treatment plan, uh, and, and like I said, taking direction uh, from from the people here. That, that you know, they're more than willing to mentor you if you're willing to to you know buy into it. And you know, I myself actually become a manager within the houses because of. My ability to take advice, follow direction, um, and you know, it helps to keep me clean to be a mentor for all these other guys. Honestly, the recovery house means pretty much everything. I mean, if I didn't have the recovery house, I would, I wouldn't know what meetings were. I wouldn't know what a 12-step program is. I wouldn't have a sponsor. Um, I wouldn't know what Good Patrol is, and you know. Being around other addicts that are just like me or a lot of similar like me, they help me and motivate me to do better and motivate me to stay in recovery because they're trying to do the same thing. You know, it's not just the houses, it's them too. You know? like I, I need those people here with me all the time. And, you know, like I said, it means everything to my recovery. Well, it's really, I mean, it's been a developing process. Um, when I first came in, it was just a few houses that was associated with the treatment center. Now we've grown tremendously. And now we're providing guys with resources for jobs, food, clothing, um, medication. We've got connections with treatment centers now. It's really been, you know, an expanding process as, as the houses have expanded. Uh, well, through these houses, um, you know, I have become a house manager and you know, I've been provided job opportunities. I will be starting working at a treatment center as a peer specialist due to my experiences here in the houses. So, you know, like these houses are the building box, building blocks to get people integrated back into society. And those guys that have successfully transitioned out of here not only are still associated with the houses by keeping in contact with the guys here. But while they were here, their time here, they expanded their network of individuals. And you know, from living in these houses, you, you get into a routine. And those, the guys that are successful, continue that routine outside of the rooms. People do recover from addiction. 
Addiction is a treatable disease, and there are some very simple steps that you can take to, su to succeed. I'm a house manager with Recovery House. What is Recovery House to me? Recovery House is a resource for sobriety. People come to Recovery House who are struggling with addiction, who don't necessarily not have somewhere to go, but need a safe environment to succeed. My life became chaotic in the use of drugs, and uh, it was very much in despair. And the recovery house was, I feel, a very key component in me recovering from uh, the life that, that I started to live. take advantage of all the tools and all the resources that are available to you. Um, sometimes it's not a matter of just picking and choosing and deciding what you're not going to do. Uh, you really have to be open to all those things that um, are going to assist you in recovering from the life that, that you found yourself in. Um, transitional living and uh, recovery housing uh, is is I think critical uh, because we lose so much in in our active addictions that we have to allow ourselves time to be able to rebuild, to be able to regrow, to be able to relearn. Yeah. I like your shirt. Yeah, the shirt. Yeah, this just tells me that. There are more people like me out there trying to help the next person. Um, if it wasn't for the recovery house, if it wasn't for the 12-step programs that I attend and do daily, um, I would still be in a gutter or under a bridge somewhere um, trying to find $5 so I can get my next fix because that's, that's what I thought I was worth. Um, today I have a whole new theory. I have a whole new outlook on life. Um, you know, instead of being the selfish, insecure, egotistical person that I was, I, that's, you know, I try and put that aside on a daily basis and try to help the next guy. And that's really how we stay sober. That's how I stay sober. You know, I guide you through the book that somebody guided me through. And it's as simple as that. It really is. You just got to take that first step and ask for help. And from there, I promise you, somebody will guide you.